I'd like to get started, so welcome to the second speaker, or the second group of speakers in our Waterfowl and Wetlands Colloquium series, Ducks, Habitat, and People. Um, I'd like to, um, in, in a minute I'll introduce our, our speakers, but I want to thank you all for coming again, and I know some of you were maybe here last week. I gave the, the first presentation, and I gave an overview of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, and um, when Dr. Hingstrom and I put this together, uh, where is Scott? But, oh, there he is. Okay. When, when Dr. Hingstrom and I put this together, we, uh, the speaker series this semester, we talked about, you know, what do we want the theme to be? Something within waterfowl and wetlands, and we got to thinking um, about this, and this is what we're hunting, by the way, I believe. Um, we got to thinking about, you know, maybe we should do something with the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. And, and we got thinking further about it, and we said, well, maybe we should do kind of three themes within that. And the three themes would be habitat, populations, and people. And today's uh, theme is the speakers that are going to talk today are going to be focused on population management of waterfowl, and they have extensive research in that area. Um, so really excited to, to have them here um, and, and coming up to UW-Stevens Point uh, for this presentation. So. Uh, I'll start by introducing Dr. Mitch Weedman, who's originally from Winona, Minnesota. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from Mississippi, or, uh, from Mississippi State and his PhD in 2014 from University of Exeter. Anyone know where that is? No? Wrong, wrong continent. It's in England. So Mitch did his PhD in England with Dr. Tony Fox, I believe. Yeah. Um, Want to live with an English accent? Yeah, you have to do the accent. Oh, sure. yeah. um, so he was there with Dr. Tony Fox, where he studied population dynamics of Greenland white-fronted geese. So Mitch is currently an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, where he teaches animal population dynamics and and management, and then also, of course, he teaches ornithology. Uh, the last thing I'll mention about Mitch: uh, when Mitch was an undergraduate at the University of Winona, he published a paper on Lester Scott uh, as an undergraduate with his with your brother Matt, correct? And uh, Tim Easley, who was here today, actually interviewed Mitch 15 years ago or so about that. So the long connection there, but you guys can can um, reconnect at, at some point. So uh, our next speaker, Dr. Lisa Webb, she's originally from Thousand <coughs> Islands, New York. She received her undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University her master's from Southern Illinois, and a PhD from Texas Tech University in 2006. Uh, the focus of Lisa's research program is to quantify the factors that influence habitat quality, use, and body condition of wetland birds during migration. And currently, Lisa serves as the USGS Assistant Leader in Wildlife for the Missouri Co-op Unit. Uh, and she teaches the Waterfowl Ecology and Management course at the University of Missouri, and also the Wetlands course. So with that, I'd like to, if you could help me, please uh, thank our speakers. Wonderful. Thanks for the introduction, Jake. And thanks for inviting us to Stevens Point. This is a real pleasure to be here. Um, these kinds of linkages are not that common. The waterfall world isn't that big. And so this is really fun to start to develop uh, more of a collaboration between the University of Missouri and um, UW Stevens Point. So thanks a lot for hosting us. It's been a, a fun but short trip with the, with the weather coming in. So we're going to continue what Jake started with regards to the North American Waterfall Management Plan. And Lisa and I were talking about how we want to structure this thing, how we want to uh, encompass something so large and to cover something that's, that's meaningful for you in, in 45 or 50 minutes. And so in tossing this around, we started thinking, well, often we manage for, for species of conservation concern. And for most folks, that probably means threatened species. And in the waterfall world, you start thinking about species like scop, species like black ducks, species like pintails. But often, uh, we don't think about overabundant populations, maybe other than Canada geese. So. This fits really well, I think, with, uh, with my research program, but also with Lisa's research program with enc uh, encompassing Arctic nesting geese. 
So these birds are a, a real problem, at least something we need to think about managing in the NAWAMP umbrella. And so that's what we're going to hit on today, that conservation concern spectrum. So what is NAWAMP? Well, I, I hope you're at uh, Jake's introductory talk, but if you weren't, what we're talking about here is, is waterfowl, uh, a continent-wide management plan for waterfowl populations in North America. So encompassing a variety of, of ducks and geese. So just as a reminder, what we're talking about is a document that was agreed to in 1986. It was signed by a variety of parties, by countries. And there are a variety of kind of goals here associated with waterfall populations. So for example, this huge goal of 62 million breeding waterfowl with specific population targets for ducks and geese and swans. And then, but also the, the habitat component that Heath is going to talk about in coming weeks. So in 2014, there's a revision to the plan. And this, uh, in red, this text is pulled from the revision. So this is uh, the population specific goal that, that this revision identified, which is this concept of abundant and resilient waterfall populations to support hunting, consumptive use, and other uses without imperiling habitat. So that's what we're going to try to hit on today. So the North American Waterfall Management Plan is, is a fairly complex, a really large document as you'd expect, but, but really surfacey stuff. It's comprised of, of a group of partners. And so folks have broken this uh, plan into a variety of areas. So these are joint ventures, which are structured from the Fish and Wildlife Service and many partners. And so that's the top uh, image of, of the U.S. The bottom one here are the flyways. So here we have a mixture of management units, joint ventures on the top, and waterfowl flyways, because we know these birds are covering thousands of miles. But that's also mixed with this concept of, of joint ventures being kind of habitat specific. And so here already we're linking these concepts, kind of administrative regions with the actual real, realization that waterfowl are, are migratory and covering huge landscapes, and then, but encompassing habitat specific features as well. So that's really the scope. Within populations though, like how do we manage these things? How do we hit these population goals? This is really, really uh, idealistic, robust stuff. So how do we get there? Well, one of the features of uh, population ecology in terms of the North American Waterfall Management Plan is, is banding data. So we have a really, really extensive data set for lots of species of waterfowl that started uh, in the 1950s, but we've been using the exact same methodology to band waterfowl on this continent since 1961. So we have an unbelievable, I mean those of you who mar work with marked animals know that, you know, boy, often we hear we wish we could have that kind of data set. We're really lucky in the waterfowl world to have this kind of a long-term time series for population analyses. So one, w one way we, we hit these objectives is to, is to ban a lot of birds. And you can get information on survival and, and other things. Another way is to fly routes. So there's this waterfowl breeding survey that's been conducted for a similarly long period of time. And all these kind of horizontal lines are different transects which are split up according to strata, kind of regions, units, uh, for sampling. And they're flown with these fixed wing aircraft every year. There are also other features though, other surveys that we kind of use as auxiliary data sets. So there are these midwinter surveys, breeding bird survey data, those of you who work with birds, maybe not waterfowl, are possibly familiar with this. Those are also routes conducted annually. And then more citizen science databases like eBird. So features that folks can log in on, you guys can log in on eBird and log today that you saw robins coming into town or, or, or whatever. Real localized kind of uh, basic science. So that's another data set. But this concept of kind of linking populations, habitats, and humans really starts to hit home, I think, when we, when we look at population trends. So from the signing of the plan in 1986 onward, you can see this, this massive increase in, in waterfowl populations. And so our task then is to, is to try to link humans with habitat, with really increasing waterfall populations. 
And that's difficult because although you have this really serious increase, actually there are some species that, that aren't increasing. And so that's what I'm going to focus on first today are these species on the left. If we think about this as kind of a, a conservation continuum from threatened to overabundant, I'm going to start with scop and, uh, and, well, and black ducks and pintails, those three primarily. And we'll, then Lisa will move into snow geese as well. And so here are species for which we've identified objectives, but we're not there yet. And so I'm going to talk about some of the tools we use in population ecology to try to hit these, these goals that we've identified in this North American Waterfall Management Plan. Okay, so objectives. So this is, a, this is an actual table from the plan, from the revised update 2014. This is what it looks like. So folks get together and use science to understand what are realistic goals for, for these species. So for black ducks, for example, this is the time series from the breeding population survey data over time from 1990 to, to, to present day. And so when we look at kind of, there are multiple surveyors, I won't get into the dynamics here, but uh, there are lots of problems with understanding black duck populations because they don't breed in Prairie Canada in the U.S. where it's relatively easy to survey. They breed in other areas, in Quebec and in Ontario and in Maine and New York places that are forested and more difficult to survey. So we need kind of alternative methods to, to understand these populations. So if you're, if you're not familiar with black ducks, the continent-wide range is, is here for North America. So the breeding areas, that kind of reddish brown and wintering areas, the blue. So this is kind of that northeastern part of Canada I was referencing. I mentioned we don't really have good breeding pair survey estimates. So here we're relying on the fact that lots of birds are banded. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. So we have a lot of band recovery data because these birds are hunted. They're shot, harvested, and they're banded, and then we get the return. And so you get kind of a survival, you do get a survival estimate from that. And then also we get this kind of age ratio uh, dynamic because hunters are uh, mailing in wings of their harvested ducks, and then we can get age ratios based on loads of wings, thousands of wings that come in every year of male, female, adult, juvenile, those age ratios and sex ratios are really important. And so here I'm just going to touch on an alternative method to understand population size in black ducks to meet the North American Waterfall Management Plan goals. So this is something that's called a Lincoln-Peterson estimator. And I'm not going to get into it in great detail, but it's basically based on the number of birds banded the number of birds recovered, so shot and hunters reporting bands, the number harvested, and then the reporting rate. And so there's a, a calculation to be had here where we can relate these things in tandem to understand what population size N, big N, is likely to be. So how do we do that? Well, we can link some things here. So we can link, for example, on the top, the top box, link an estimate, the number of uh, young birds that are, that are marked in August, the number of adults that are also marked in August. So this gives us an, an estimate of winter survival. And so we get like a, a winter estimate for adults. Birds in winter survive, a portion of them survive to, through summer, and they reproduce. And we get a fecundity estimate as well from the banding data. So we can convert these to, to symbols for survival, and for fecundity, F, and you can get at these, these kinds of rates, all using banding data, banding and, and the wing data. And so you can get at things like fecundity, or the number of young produced every year in black ducks. So this is a relationship between harvest, the number of, the, the ratio of wings that we get, and strictly banding data. Lots of black ducks banded every year. And you can see these things roughly capture the same pattern, which is a relatively stable <laughs> Uh, fecundity rate in black ducks. That formula I showed a second ago was this Lincoln-Peterson estimate, this concept that you can use banding data and wing data to get a population estimate. And so that's what we've done here. And I've got the little training wheels picture here because this is uh, work done with Todd Arnold at the University of Minnesota and we're just beginning this for black ducks. So this is initial cut, first cut kind of stuff. But it's just to say, hey, there are ways that we can estimate population size 
even though we don't have good population survey information for black ducks and we're able to do that. So this is a way that we can hit NAWAMP population goals, a, a robust assessment, because if your assessment isn't very good, it's not actually that useful to link to the NAWAMP goal. So you need a robust assessment and then start looking at management implications of hitting the goal. And that's what we're trying to do. So moving on then, that was black ducks. We're going to continue on to SCOP, so another species in the threatened kind of column of, of conservation concern. So this is a part of North America where you actually, you're not far from lots and lots of SCOP. So um, when Jake and, and Heath and Lisa are taking their classes later this month, or in March, um, they're going to be banding a lot of SCOP in these areas of the Mississippi River and the Illinois River. So this is a part of the world that traditionally harvested a lot of SCOP. But in recent years, these population estimates suggest a fairly serious decline, despite, again, the overall number of ducks, which has been increasing. This is not that new. This is 17, 20 years old, this concept that SCOP are declining. So this is a paper that Jane Austen and others um, in North Dakota published in the year 2000 on declining SCOP populations. What on earth is going wrong with SCOP? Why are they not increasing like everybody else? And so one of the key hypotheses over the years is this concept of zebra mussels. Probably almost all of you are now familiar with zebra mussels. Are, are expanding their range and the ducks are eating these mussels. So they're changing their prey source. But also the inverts are being, the communities of invertebrates are changing because of, of zebra mussel filtering. So there's a huge community dynamic here that folks are trying to explore. And this is just the range of lesser scop. So they cover a huge swath of North America. So a second ago we worked with banding data and we worked with uh, what's called parts collection survey data which is that wing data, the age ratio information. I'm going to take that a little bit more forward now. So really basic population models. When we think about population size n in a given year, that's comprised of b which is births, i which is immigrants, and that's all subtracted from D, which is deaths, and E, which is emigrants. So this is the classic BIDE model in population ecology. So you have a relationship between new birds coming in, birds being hatched, and then birds dying, and birds leaving your area where you're actually not sampling them. And so you can do this in a kind of two-age framework. So you've got a population size of juveniles, the same for adults. Adults reproduce, and that's called recruitment. Not, juveniles survive. That's juvenile survival. Adults survive and they continually inform that adult age class. New birds come in, those are immigrants, and some birds leave, those are emigrants. And we use symbols for these just the same. So now, what I've called Demography 201, we're taking a serious step up from that initial population modeling framework to something which is called integrated population models. So this is a framework we're using now for lots of different species around the world in animal ecology. But the critical component here is it allows you to link multiple data sets, not just banding and parts collection survey data, lots of different data in one model to produce a population estimate. So I'm going to show an example here of two different data sets. So we have this B which is the beta, that's a recruitment measure. The kind of W symbol is omega, that's immigration, the birds coming into a place. The, the phi symbols, that's survival for juveniles and adults, and then psi, this trident, is juvenile and adult emigration, birds leaving an area. So we get all this information, but at the same time, we're getting information on how long, how, how likely you are to see a bird given it's in the area. That's reciting probability, or recovery rate, if you're talking about harvested species. That's the green circles here, P juve and P ad, juveniles and adults. So. I know this is getting complex, but the point is just to say all of these rates work together to produce a population size which is n with the blue circle. We can also encounter or, or include some observation error so we know humans aren't perfect. We know there's some error here and we can include that in the modeling framework. That produces uh, a modeled population n which we can compare to an observed population size like from breeding survey information. So it's a really powerful tool that we can use to link estimated populations with observed populations. And 
a few examples here in the SCOP context. So we're using wings to get at beta, that B, the number of young. And then we're banding birds to get at recovery rate. So what does that look like? Well, for survival for SCOP, this is um, juveniles on the bottom, adult, males and, and females, and then adults on the top. And you can see whichever trend you follow over time, from the 1950s to present, it's relatively stable. If we look at fecundity, the number of young in the population, these rates also fairly similar over time, relatively stable. So key feature here is that none of these demographic rates seem to mirror the population decline in SCOP, which is a bit puzzling for us. But as I mentioned, we can link these survival and fecundity estimates, the number of young, to get a modeled population size, which you can then compare to the observed population size. So earlier, I showed uh, uh, the trend in SCOP, which was declining over time. That's the black solid line. The white solid line is the modeled population estimate of SCOP at the same, during the same time series using all these data sets with the dotted lines, the, the credible intervals. So our confidence that these estimates are reflecting what's actually happening. The red arrows are peaks, which are typically considered to be erroneous or noise. And our IPM, our model, this integrated model has not followed those peaks. So it does suggest that those are probably error, error, error kind of points in the record. So this is viewed from multiple demographic angles. And the key point here is that juvenile, female survival, and fecundity are responsible for the past change and decline in, in SCOP abundance across the traditional survey area. Adult female survival has had very little impact, and we have no evidence of a systematic decline in survival, wh whatever rate you followed. Harvest, I'm not going to get into too much. We're continuing to look at that. But importantly here, hunting is very unlikely, given these estimates, to be altering population dynamics in lesser scop. So I think that's really an important point because often we think that hunting is a major factor in these populations. Okay, my last section is on pintails. So we've done basic population models with banding data and with wing ratios of ages. We've done more complex models, integrated population models, where we incorporate other sources of information. The final bit then is taking demographic rates and saying, well, that's nice to know. Thanks very much for the survival estimate. But we want to know how environmental drivers, how factors like habitat influence population dynamics in these species. So what we're trying to do now is link habitat with survival and productivity. So these are the types of relationships you might expect that uh, for good habitat, you have an overall higher rate of reproduction and survival than if you had poor habitat. In terms of harvest, there's this concept of additive versus compensatory mortality. So the concept that additive harvest, everything we shoot is against the population rate. Compensatory, these birds were going to die anyway in some way. They're either poor condition or otherwise. And so uh, it's not actually, hunting is not altering the population. So there's a relationship here that we can explore. And at some point here, uh, you'd assume that you can shoot lots of ducks before it starts harming these demographic rates, at which point if you shoot enough ducks, then it becomes actually additive. It becomes a problem. And that's what the red circle is kind of highlighting. So there are relationships here between additive and, and compensatory mortality in good habitat and bad habitat. So in that light, we're talking pintails here, which have a similar population trend to SCOP, major decline over time. We form this annual cycle model. So pintail do lots of different things. Some of them breed in the prairie pothole region. Some of them breed in Alaska. Some of them winter in California. Some of them winter in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have all this different kind of exchange happening among areas, breeding areas and wintering areas. And we can actually model those kinds of relationships. So we're starting simple. Although they do lots of different things, we're saying, all right, that's really complex. Let's look at only breeding areas and only wintering areas, just as a big composite of what's likely happening. And we use these integrated population models, which combine these different data sets. 
So in our case, again, we're using the band recovery data that I mentioned before for the same stuff we used for black ducks and for Scott. We're using the breeding population survey, which we used for Scott, and the wings, the parts collection survey, the ratio of these wings, which we used for the other species as well. And we're able to get at this habitat feature. So here are age ratios, the productivity estimate of pintails over this time series. From this integrated model, we can also get harvest rates, which are juvenile and adult specific and female and male specific. And those produce these, and then we also factor in these annual survival estimates, same different cohorts. And we don't really see much going on with survival. But again, our predicted model, the solid black line, matches the observed population, the blue line, actually pretty well. So really low variation in adult survival, but high variation in how many young pintails are on the landscape every year. So we don't really see density dependence in, in, in compensation in the number of young. But importantly, we have this prediction framework in place that allows us to test uh, habitat and other features of demographic rates at particular levels. So a lot of my recent work is focusing on this, this relationship with, with variation in productivity. And so here specifically we're looking at a rework of, of the wing data. So again, we based fecundity, the number of young, on, on the ratio of harvested wings, adults versus juveniles. That's not particularly spatially explicit because we don't know where birds were hatched, where they came from. We only know where they were shot. So we're flipping the, the coin here and saying, okay, well, uh, we actually have a lot of information about where birds were banded, where they came from, spatially explicit across all of Prairie Canada and the U.S. Thousands of banding records over time. And we can split this into regions we know are important, like the parklands of Prairie Canada versus the prairies of Prairie Canada. And further, Alberta parklands, Alberta prairies. And we can look at the proportion of juveniles. So these are actual age ratios for mallards in black, pintails in red, and blue-winged teal in blue. So we're doing kind of a multi-dabbling duck species analysis here of, of productivity, spatially explicit in all these different areas of Prairie Canada. But also, this framework allows us to work in land cover data and pond count data. So habitat features, which are very likely important in explaining that variation in productivity that we found earlier. So this is the type of model we're, we're, we're talking about here. Summer fallow is a, a common practice in agriculture of um, using the field every other year. And so in those every other years, you get corn, and then in another year, you might get a, a random grassy kind of field. So we're predicting that land cover the amount of, of the right habitat and the amount of water on the landscape influence how many young are on the landscape. And we've been able to do this in different regions. So this is just the Saskatchewan prairies. The colors are kind of the different decades. And this is pond count. So this is the relationship you'd expect. The more ponds there are, the more young juvenile, the, the, the young pintail that there are on the landscape. The relationship's even stronger for summer fallow, this relationship with this, this habitat feature, this agricultural practice. And the same thing for natural area, which is the conservation reserve program grasslands and, and habitat types that Heath will probably get into. So summer fallow, we know, explains uh, a lot of variation in how many young are on the landscape, but that's <coughs> declining over time. So can we increase the availability of other habitats? We also know that natural area is changing. So this, there was a huge relationship here with how many young were on the landscape. So we need new forms of natural area. I won't get into the conservation reserve program today, but these were grasslands that sustained duck populations for a long time in Prairie Canada and the US. Uh, but now, with the, the conservation reserve program declining, we've had a, a, an unfortunate kind of shift in land management practices. So what can we do to alter these, these uh, landscape features. And then pond count is important, which um, kind of validates or, or supports a lot of the previous work we know with waterfall populations. 
So we use these integrated models to look at variation in demographic rates like productivity and survival. We haven't had a spatial layer here, um, but we're going to add it to the integrated model. And this concept that proportion of juveniles, the number of young, uh, is a really promising proxy for spatially explicit productivity or fecundity estimates. And so we're doing a variety of things next um, to better understand relationships between demographic rates and, and, um, and habitat features. And this really leads into some of the scenario playing that we're hoping to do. So you can crank the lever on the amount of habitat on the landscape and then predict the relationship with how many young are on the landscape or how long they live. And so that's where we're, that's where we're at now. Okay. And now Lisa's going to take snow geese. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, again, thank you for inviting both of us to, to Wisconsin um, and for having such uh, lovely weather for us up until about 6 o'clock tonight. Um, you'll probably figure this out soon enough, but in the interest of full disclosure, I am not a population modeler or ecologist. My research program and questions focus more on habitat conditions and how habitat conditions influence uh, waterfowl and water birds' ability to acquire nutrients and lipids that they use to meet their uh, life history events and how that can in turn kind of cross um, seasons and cross habitats. And so my approach to, to this uh, aspect of the talk comes from more a bottom up of uh, habitats influencing body condition. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about that, uh, that far right end of the spectrum, that um, picture of Mitch put up, the, uh, the mid-continent light goose population. So the 2012 revision of the NAWAMP plan specifically called for um, you know, waterfowl populations, abundant, or abundant and resilient waterfowl populations to support hunting and other uses. The key to this part of the talk is without imperiling habitats. And this is where uh, light geese come in. You can see from um, this table in terms of objectives and the mean population size, <coughs> unlike a lot of the examples Mitch showed, the actual objective population is lower than cur what currently exists. And so trying to scale that back to fewer birds because, again, that, that red highlighted portion, the imperiling habitat. So anybody seen a, a site like this? If you haven't, you will probably in the next few weeks. We saw a couple uh, decent sized flocks on the drive up. Um, but snow geese um, weren't always um, overabundant. In 1916, they actually had to limit uh, snow goose hunting um, along the eastern uh, United States or in the eastern United States because of low population numbers. Um, but scenes like this have become increasingly common and based on some midwinter um, indices that have been done, you can see the, the almost exponential increase in um, projected snow goose, po light goose populations, snow goose populations, um, starting in about the 1970s, and um, I think it's actually gotten a little higher than this into 2012. And so um, these populations have been expanding rapidly. And some of the reasons why that um, have been are related to changes in, in agriculture. So um, since 1960, use of, in ag of nitrogen in agricultural lands has increased over by eight t eightfold. So you can see the uh, amount of uh, corn, maybe I just put, yeah, corn harvested and rice harvested since the 1950s, and the uh, addition of nitrogen and how that has ramped up or helped ramp up the amount of um, agricultural grains both produced and harvested. And what this has led to is increase in energy for available for, for snow geese on their wintering and migration habitats. In some cases, some part portions of their yeah, wintering and migration habitats. The other thing that's uh, thought to have contributed to the expansion in the population is the establishment of refuges, which it's hard to separate out how much um, the change in agricultural land use and production influence the population relative to um, refuge or amount of refuge lands that were put into refuge because they happen at about the increases happen along the same timeline. So it's hard to separate those out. 
but the increased uh, refuge land set aside where um, hunt birds could get away from hunting pressure um, and then also acquire nutrients and lipids that they need to complete migration and to initiate nesting activities really increased and so those in conjunction really have led to or thought we think they've led to this expansion in uh, snow goose populations. So just a little bit of background on the um, kind of the, the major wintering areas, migration routes, and then uh, breeding routes. You can see the um, Mississippi Flyway and the Central Flyway are our major um, migration routes for mid-continent uh, light geese. And the areas in green represent the major breeding colonies. And as Mitch noted in his, his portion of the talk, the banding, a lot of, they've been banding um, these breeding colonies, birds in these breeding colonies for a while now. Um, in general though, you can kind of, um, there's two distinct portions of the, the light goose population or the snow goose population um, separating the uh, breeding colonies into the Arctic, which comprises um, five breeding colonies. I think I only have four marked there. And then the subarctic, which is um, La Perouse Bay, a little lower on, on the Hudson Bay. And what I'd like you to keep in mind is that 90% of, of the population is estimated to come from the Arctic uh, breeding population, whereas only 10% comes from the, the subarctic um, breeding population. And that's based on band recoveries. Well, so what's the issue? Um, issue is changes that changes in the population are, are leading to habitat alteration on the breeding grounds. So um, on the breeding grounds, uh, lesser, well, on the wintering grounds, energetically, the birds have been released. They've got as much energy, almost as much energy as they want. And so they're able to put on body condition, or improve their body condition, put on lipids, and, and really improve their survival. Um, where this becomes an issue is when you get that number of birds uh, trying to fit into Arctic nesting habitats. And their specific style of foraging, or grubbing is the technical term, um, they're spending 18 hours a day um, essentially pulling um, grasses on Arctic breeding grounds and subarctic breeding grounds out by the roots. So, and then um, they're doing this pre-breeding um, as well as after the eggs hatch or af and they're bringing their, their goslings with them. And by pulling the, the grasses out by the roots, it's reducing the ground cover, leading to higher evaporation in the soils and making those soils essentially hypersaline, increasing the salinity where new grasses can't germinate. And so what's starting out as um, habitat that looks like this, after snow geese come in, pull everything out, you can see here's an exclosure where they kept the snow geese out of, out of that one area, but that's where everything else looks like, where the snow geese were. And it's not, the grasses aren't growing back because of the, the hypersalinity or high saline soils. So there's um, concern that this is impacting some of the other Arctic breeding species, that this alteration of, of nesting habitats um, may impact other species that are trying to nest there, including savanna sparrows, which their populations have undergone, well, not populations, but the number of nesting pairs that uh, occur in the same region has um, gone down by 77%. Um, and they, they use a lot of the same habitats that the snow geese are using, black pole warblers and the, um, the Lapland longspur. And the, uh, this is another picture. Um, you can see actually the, the red is um, uh, a microbe that is specific to high saline soils. And so you'll see it's not even aerial photos of um, Arctic nesting uh, breeding grounds and it, it looks red in color and that's usually why is because that nothing else can occur there other than that one specific mi microbe that kind of manifests itself in the red color. Well, um, in response to expanding snow goose populations and documented alterations to what Arctic breeding habitats, um, one of the responses, or was, um, well, one of the first responses was Bruce Batt, uh, 
co-authored or, or was the editor for a, a paper called Arctic Ecosystems in Peril. And this really approached, this was in the um, late 80s, um, and approached the snow goose population expansion from a, from a number of, of angles in terms of what might be, how populations had changed, what might be contributing to these population changes, and most specifically, what could be done about it. What, what Tar or what demographic groups needed to be targeted to try and uh, bring this the populations back down. And uh, lambda, uh, so a lambda, for those of you who are in population modeling classes, a lambda of one is steady state growth. And it was estimated at the time, the lambda was about, or steady population, uh, lambda for snow geese was about 1.05, uh, so increasing. And to bring it down, that really you needed, what would do it the fastest was reductions in annual adult mortality. That if you could, you could bring that down, you could reduce the, those population growth rates to something other, lower than one, and that would eventually bring your populations down. So recognizing that adult survival was the main factor driving, uh, that, that could influence uh, snow goose populations, the Lake Goose Conservation Order was implemented in 1999. Anyone participated in the, the Lake Goose Conservation Order? Yes, yeah, okay. Um, so for those of you who haven't, it's, it, it's an expanded season. It allows for the take of light geese after traditional hunting seasons end. Um, you can s harvest light geese uh, through, um, well, I'm most familiar with it in Nebraska, but through March or even April in some parts of Canada. So everything else that you can't hunt in the spring, you can go after light geese. And this was a specific effort to reduce their adult survival. In addition, it allows for the use of, of some other um, technology that, that can't be used during regular uh, hunting season, including electronic calls, unplugged shotguns, and expanded um, hunting hours, and, and really no bag limit. So doing everything they can to use hunting as a mechanism to try and reduce the population. Well, like I said, that was implemented in 1999, and the big question has been, is it working? Um, some of, uh, there have been quite a few researchers spending a lot of time looking at this. Um, Ray Alasoskis is one of them, and this figure shows, okay, here's uh, overall harvest over time. And so the gray is just regular season harvest and the black portions of the bar, that was after the implementation of the conservation order. And the black is all the birds that were taken as part of the conservation order. So you can see that um, while still we're not harvesting quite as many birds in the conservation order, it's adding to the overall number of birds harvested in a given year. And this figure shows the, the average harvest probability um, for adult birds. Again, adult birds were what we're really trying to uh, increase the harvest probability on. So before the conservation order, everything to the, the left of um, that line, and then after the, the red, or sorry, the white and black circles represent that Arctic and subarctic breeding population. So again, if we are um, increasing harvest probability, for, for any one population, it's the, it's the subarctic, which is only 10% of the breeding population. And then other than 90% is, is still a pretty low harvest probability. So that doesn't mean good things for the conservation order. And then here's what get, is really telling, it's the survival estimates. And the, this is, um, again, for those, the, um, the northern, or the Arctic in the, in the black circles and the, um, the subarctic in the in the white circles, that while the uh, survival probability for the subarctic birds went down, the Arctic or 90% of the population survival probability stayed essentially the same. Which, if if you could do the math, means that the conservation order is, is probably not working. Well, they did the math, and here are the population estimates um, broken down into adult birds and which is the black circles and juveniles or um, hatchier birds in the white circles. And you can see not only is based on the conservation order, the population has continued to expand and it's continued to expand in the part where we didn't want it to, which was the adults. 
So if you've been um, paying attention, you'll notice, look at these, um, these are uh, population estimates derived by, from Lincoln Peterson. As Mitch mentioned, those are, you, they use band recovery. You might notice that, look at these numbers, now it's closer to uh, 10 and maybe up to 15 million birds, whereas before, midwinter was five or six. And one of the um, issues there is that, again, how you derive these population estimates, you get slightly different, that the original uh, midwinter count was, was closer, three to th five million birds, but using the, the band recovery data to generate Lincoln-Peterson estimates, we can see it's kind of a double whammy. Not only uh, is the conservation order not being as successful as we hoped in terms of reducing the population, there were probably more geese out there than those midwinter uh, indices originally indicated. So not only do we have to um, deal with the survival probability, but that now there's more birds to be reduced than um, we thought. And this led to the, the question and, and um, some research that my graduate student, one of my graduate students is doing, well, are we shooting the right geese? What geese are we shooting? We're, we're, we know we're probably not shooting as many adults based on the, the harvest probabilities, but what birds are we shooting? And, and how does that relate to their body condition? Um, some ideas about harvest and harvest susceptibility is that perhaps poor birds are, are actually more likely to be harvested because they're, they're more likely to go into decoys. Um, and that geese in, in better body condition might be less susceptible to harvest. And those, those the models, um, they're based solely on band recoveries. And so they don't look at body condition and harvest susceptibility related to, to body condition. So the, our question was whether the, not only is the conservation order maybe not working in terms of reducing um, harvest susceptibility for the adults, what if we're rem removing birds that are in poor condition and leaving more resources for the birds that, that aren't decoying in in the first place? So taking a look at, at which geese are, are, are being harvested, band recovery data indicate that it's the juveniles. It's that they have a higher overall harvest susceptibility. And again, we're wondering if, if juveniles maybe not being as good a body condition um, may, may be more likely to be harvested, you combine poor body, potential poor body condition with inexperience and, and that may be what's driving the uh, harvest susceptibility of these juveniles. And so we wanted to look at differences in um, body condition between individuals that were being harvested through the conservation order versus just general population birds. The idea being that if, if you're seeing differences, um, if actually improving, the, or not improving, taking birds out of the population that maybe weren't gonna breed to begin with, juveniles or birds in poor body condition, you leave resources for birds that were already in pre pretty good body condition, and that that might have implications for how many eggs they can lay. Some, a really neat study in the, in the set 1970s looked at um, the clutch size that uh, snow geese could produce relative to the amount of protein they brought with them to the breeding grounds and the amount of lipids. And so you can see that improving body condition, both in terms of nutri or, uh, protein and lipids, allows birds to lay more eggs. So again, the idea that um, maybe by removing birds that were less likely to breed increases the chances that, that there's more food for the remaining birds and that they could actually increase um, their, their product, production and recruitment. And so we did a, a pilot study looking at just differences in birds that were harvested over decoys as part of the conservation order and that were harvested or jump shot. And so the jump shot birds were supposed to represent general population, just shooting birds out of the population. And so in general body mass, you can see um, a difference for, look at the, the snow geese um, in terms of uh, the, the body mass. So 1,700 grams versus 2,200 grams. It just, and this is overall body mass, and, um, but it does account for differences in body size. So structurally, larger bird, we account for the fact there just are larger birds that may have higher body mass, but even after accounting for that, there's a difference in the two techniques. So we looked at, um, well, body condition of birds harvested. That was just for Nebraska, and we wanted to expand it. 
So we collected birds in, in four locations in two years. Arkansas, kind of just when they're starting migration, um, near Squaw Creek in Missouri, in the rainwater basin of Nebraska, and then up in South Dakota. And we collected birds through uh, jump shooting uh, to represent the general population. Birds that probably, or probably wouldn't have been harvested or, or were not as likely to be harvested. And then we used hunter collected birds as our, um, as our decoy shot birds. And then this is my graduate student, Drew Fowler. He spent a lot of time shaving birds to, to get at um, their overall body condition. So taking measurements relative to their body length, their wing cord, tarsus, uh, middle toe, um, head length, and culmen. And then the glamorous job of a waterfowl biologist often includes um, you know, prepping birds, doing dissections, and then running them through a meat grinder. <laughs> So, but this allowed us to, to evaluate their overall body mass minus kind of any food they had in their esophagus as well as their overall lipids and their overall protein. Things that we know are related to a bird's ability to produce eggs. And I'll spare you the details, but we did adjust for body size again. So all the results I'll be presenting account for the fact that just larger bodied birds may have more protein. Accounting for that, that that is indicate all, our, all of our results. Um, what we did look at was, um, so look for differences in harvest type. Again, those are general population versus birds that might be harvested through the conservation order. Sex, age, because we think the juveniles might be more susceptible to harvest. Um, and, and if their body condition plays into that, that may be part of it. And we looked for color phase and then also region. A little bit about the harvest demographics. So this is Arkansas, and you can see that um, on the left is kind of what would be harvested over decoy shot birds, and on the right is the general population. We see definite differences in, in the, the demographic makeup of general population birds. It's much more geared towards um, adults, uh, adult males and adult females versus the harvested birds is made up, a majority of that is the juveniles. And that trend continues for Missouri. Again, the, the general population birds, the birds that aren't likely, as likely to be harvested, are mostly adults. And only, uh, I think, 14% of them were juveniles compared to the, the decoy shot birds which had over 50% uh, juveniles. We saw a little bit of an anomaly in Nebraska um, that for most of the, a, a lot of the uh, um, after hatchier females, or sorry, after hatchier males um, were both the jump shot and the, uh, the general population. But then we, in South Dakota, kind of went back to that trend of decoy shot birds being primarily juveniles and, and the uh, general population being, being adults. So looking at, at some of the modeling we've done, if you just look at differences, what's causing differences in body mass, um, these indicate that harvest technique, there, there are differences in body mass between harvest technique and so that the jump shot birds, those general population birds, are on average um, heavier or have a heavier body mass than the, uh, than the decoy birds. We also see a difference in, in state. And so this is relative to all the other states. So what this tells us is that as birds are going north, they're, they're gaining body mass. They're, they're able to put on body mass in South, they're way more in South Dakota than they did in the other three states. When you look at lipids, so this is, that was just body mass, looking at lipids, and this is what we know influences egg production, you see three factors come out. It's age, so the juvenile birds actually have more lipids, which was surprising. The jump shot birds, general population birds, have more lipids, and then South Dakota birds, the further north they are, the more lipids they have. And what this looks like, if you break it down by state, we'll start in Arkansas and work our way north, that the after hatchier birds or the adults um, are on the left and on the right are the hatchier birds and then you ca compare the decoy versus the jump shot birds. In almost all cases, it, or for almost all the states, the, the hatchier birds, the younger birds have more lipids and the, 
the decoy birds have less lipids than the general population. So that was pretty consistent. Even it, it wasn't a trend that, that sort of magnified or um, what didn't become apparent. It, it started out that way and, and, and progress or sort of maintained that uh, relationship through migration. And then for protein, we see again harvest technique. Those jump shot birds have uh, more protein. Unlike the lipids, the juveniles have less protein. The adults had more. And then there's the um, difference in uh, latitude with South Dakota, birds collected in South Dakota actually having less protein. So what that looks like in terms of uh, protein levels for hatchier and after hatchier birds, consistently those uh, jump shot birds had more protein than, than, your, uh, than your birds that are being harvested through the conservation order. And so kind of putting this together, and we're still working on some of the, the analysis and processing samples, but if you think about what that means for the lipid and protein levels of birds that are being harvested versus the birds that are general population or aren't as likely to be harvested, and what that means for their ability to produce eggs once they hit the nesting grounds, then you can start to, to think about what might happen with the conservation order or why we may not be seeing some of the the results that we expected or as much of a reduction in, in the population. The next step of what we're working on, so we've got adult and juvenile birds and we know that they were harvested part of the conservation order or probably weren't going to be harvested or part of the general population, but we don't know where they're from. That, that you know, they could be going to the Arctic breeding grounds where 90% of the birds are from, there's a good chance, or they could be going to the subarctic. Um, so what we're working on now is using um, stable isotopes. We're pulling feathers from the birds to determine where they grew those feathers, on the, which breeding colony they were from. And we found that we're able to um, pretty uh, definitively say kind of we can differentiate between Arctic and subarctic breeding colonies. Among the, the five or so Arctic breeding colonies, we aren't as, uh, aren't as sure about being able to say from a feather where they came from, but Arctic versus subarctic, we can. And so then we can start to think about, all right, what birds are we harvesting relative to um, where we know birds are headed and um, where we know the, the conservation order has already been pretty effective in reducing the population or increasing harvest susceptibility. So in putting all the pieces together for what Mitch and I have talked about today, NAWAMP is really about habitat, populations, and people. And you think about the changing, uh, the, the great changes we've seen in, in dabbling duck um, populations and increases, and how that relates to the amount of habitat that conservation agencies and uh, nonprofits have been able to put on the ground. That, that we're Based on some of the population work Mitch is doing, um, pretty sure there's a relationship there. And then kind of how populations also influence human user groups. Sounds like Kent will be talking in, in a few weeks about how human users can not both influence populations, but then it, populations may also be able to drive interest through human user groups. And then finally, um, how human users um, can contribute to habitat through duck stamps, through uh, um, purchasing a, of hunting license, and all the money that goes into habitat conservation. And so, just to put it in context, we've been talking about wildlife, pop waterfowl populations, and then um, it, it's part of a bigger picture, though. And so these population models um, that, that Mitch covered really represent not new approaches to, that allow us to use um, data from different sources that we hadn't been able to use before to estimate populations. And with these methods, um, we're able to recreate or estimate uh, robust demographic rates, things like survival and movements and productivity and population sizes that before we had um, coarser estimates of or maybe even just indices of. And what this means is that, as Mitch gave it a great example of, we can link spatially explicit harvest and habitat management with demographic rates to look at how those in factors influence each other. How much does harvest really drive populations or influence populations? And these methods are important because although we know waterfowl are, are most 
waterfowl species are doing pretty well, um, the, the continental scale of management that's required to kind of progress towards NAWAMP goals requires us to take a, a broad picture look at this. And then kind of what Drew Fowler, my PhD student, and I are working on is looking at the, the body condition assessment and those stable isotopes to look at not just as a bird um, male or female or juvenile or adult, but what was its body condition and how does that relate to its harvest susceptibility and ability to uh, produce eggs and, and uh, its fecundity to get at some of those underlying um, demographic rates or the mechanisms that underlie those demographic rates. And this is important because although, like I said, that most waterfowl populations are doing pretty well, um, having these methods allows us not just to understand what's going on now, but to develop models or methods to evaluate how populations will respond to changing landscapes and environmental conditions. And so run, um, make future predictions about what it might look like if, if we are able to increase wetland habitat by 20% in certain regions, or if we reduce uh, uh, or increase harvest rates uh, by a certain percentage in some rates, what that might do to populations. So not just to understand what's going on now, but to have an idea of what might happen in the future in response to changing landscapes. So with that, we have uh, quite a few people to thank, especially those who um, collected data and banded the birds and I think that that was all we had for All right, is there any uh, uh, any questions for Lisa or Mitch? Yeah, you can come up here too. Yeah. <laughs> From all this way we have to have one question. I have one about the Oh, I'm sorry. How do you think we could see like management practices start to change in the future? Like, what do you think is the next step? Mm. I mean, for, for any specific species? For, well, for snow geese and I guess for pintails and scoff too. I can do dabbling ducks. So, that's a really good question because for a long time it's been difficult to link demographic rates like survival and productivity with habitat, which is something we can manage. So. Like to link a lot of this stuff with climate change or with um, broad scale environmental patterns is, is useful to know, but really hard to manage. And so linking these rates with, with things that we can manage, like habitat, is more meaningful for us, more practical. And so some of these population models that we're working with now for dabbling ducks, and certainly those could be expanded to other species, finally enable these linkages. So using alternative measures for productivity, not the wing survey data, but actually like banding records, which are tied to specific places, is useful because we know the habitats where these birds were, were banded. And where they, ban where they were banded is very likely where they were hatched. And so that's a really useful measure, super local productivity. So you can ask, well, like what are the features of those areas that are habitat based, that either produce lots of birds or not many? And among those that produce lots of birds, what can we do to do more of that? And, and, and then that promotes survival as well. So there are those linkages that we're now able to make. And Todd has shown that with black ducks. Uh, we're working on that. Dave Coons is leading that for SCOP. And, then, and I'm doing quite a bit of that for pintail. So for dabbling ducks, that's kind of where we're at. And, and again, I think we can expand to lots of other species as well. And then I don't know if you want to add anything on light geese. Yeah, for light geese, I think it's probably more of a philosophical issue of we, we've seen the population expand, but do we really know enough about how the population is changing habitats and influencing other species to be able to say this is too many? And so I think um, documenting or, or being able to, to demonstrate how that population is impacting other species in a more direct way than, than has previously been done is probably the next step before any concrete management changes occur. How are, with the changes, as I understand because of the budget, with less banding and less increase, less interest in the wing uh, surveys, are, are these going to influence what you're finding with the populations? The ability to 
put together the, the, the formulas that you're looking at, are, are those going to have an impact or no? Yeah, boy, I hope not. That would be a huge bummer, you know, <laughs> to have to correct for a lack of data in the future in a field where we have so much information and such a legacy of long-term banding information. So, I mean, we ban thousands of ducks every year, thousands. So you would have to f pretty drastically reduce the number for it to influence kind of these huge, broad-scale estimates. But more to your point, like the point of linking survival and productivity with habitat is to really zoom in locally. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine if without data, you won't be able to do that. And so you have to then broaden your scope. So maybe instead of a couple regions in Canada, maybe it's all of Canada. Well, that's not particularly useful because of all the different land management practices and habitat conditions which we know are in different places in Canada. So I, that's kind of a long way of saying I really hope that it doesn't come to that point. And those of us working in population modeling in, in the waterfowl community will uh, continue to try to push the importance of these records to informing estimates. We can't manage populations if we don't understand the rates that contribute to them. And so banding data is first and foremost, and I know folks with the Fish and Wildlife Service recognize that, but certainly we'll do all we can to continue to, to push that theme. And we hope you guys can too, because there will be a public component to this in time. I also think hunters would have something to say about fewer bands being put out. Yeah, I had one. Do you ever foresee lake goose populations crashing, maybe as a result of diseases or? Yeah, it, it, we were talking about this on the drive up. I, I shudder to think what the population would get to before they crash, having gone up to some of the banding sites and, and seeing the amount of habitat that, that's there. I, I, I think we're, we're a ways away from that, at least in terms of uh, resource availability and nutrition. Disease, I'm not sure, but it, given the rate that the population has expanded thus far, and it doesn't, disease doesn't seem to be playing much of a role. Um, yeah, I, if, it, if it's going to happen, I think we're, we're still quite a ways off from it, would be my guess. <coughs> On the light piece, um, two questions. One is, do you have information on the har hunter harvest rates mm -hmm. for the conservation order and then after? Yes, um, we have band, band recovery uh, data and then also the part survey that, that we're, and that's part of Drew's, what he's working on is, is comparing that um, before the conservation order, after the conservation order, and then kind of his technique that looks at uh, a different way of sampling you know, as opposed to band recovery or parts collection. And how did they differ? We're, we're still we're still pulling numbers, but yeah. Um. So the other question is, you, you showed that there's a lack of evidence for additive mortality mm -hmm. with the conservation order. You know, if anyone's ever projected, if we didn't have a conservation order, what would the goose population be? Yeah, I, I don't know. Did, Ray didn't do that in his monograph, did he? No, but if, if, if harvest is not additive, then uh, what we're observing now is likely to be what you'd see if you didn't have a season at all. But so, so in other words, we're shooting birds that would have died because they're weak or, or they happen to be a poor condition. And so I think one side of the coin is, well, how many would there be if you didn't have a season? But the other side is, how many birds, geez, if we're not influencing harvest now, <laughs> how many birds do you have to shoot yeah. before you start to see additive mortality? Which is maybe the more interesting question from management perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you get at this, this population size. And those are also, unfortunately, just projections, you know. But certainly we know that, like, despite peaks and troughs and the number of young ones every year, we still see just this year-on-year -year increase in population size, irrespective of how many people shoot birds. So it's pretty amazing, I mean, a population response. Nothing we're doing seems to be slowing them down in any way. Yeah, it's, it's uh, unbelievable. We don't have many examples in the wildlife world like this, you know. It seems like the wariness changed dramatically yeah. from before to after. And so I, I, that's why I asked the question about hunter success rates. Yeah, and yeah. It, and I don't know about the specific, I mean, you used to be able to put plastic bags out there and they'd come in for them. But uh, yeah, they are a, a lot warier. Um, I think hunters are getting better too. As, as the geese are getting warier, 
um, guided hunts are becoming more of a thing and and putting out larger spreads and, and kind of going to the places that the snow geese are, are bottlenecking in in migration and so mm -hmm. um, yeah Are there any other alternative methods for controlling the population other than hunting? The, um, the Arctic, I think it was the Arctic Goose Joint Venture, it put out, or maybe it's Fish and Wildlife Service in conjunction with the Arctic Goose Joint Venture, put out um, sort of all the possible solutions. When they were thinking about the conservation order, what, what, what are ways we could do w that would reduce adult survival? One idea they had was the, the million dollar goose. It never went forward, but it was um, put a band that if you recovered it, it was worth a million dollars. They ran the numbers and figured the probability that anyone would, would get that band was so low they'd be willing to take the chance of it. But I get the, the projected increase in hunter participation and harvest didn't really even, it didn't look like it would be effective. Um, so there, there is that um, out there in terms of what might be next or what, what, what the next phase is to implement or management strategy to pursue, I don't know that there's been much discussion. Like I said, I think it's, it's getting back to the, the philosophical <coughs> debate of do we really know there are too many or how many is too many a, until we can link it to specific or more direct um, implications for other species. So. We will take one last question from Larry, and then we'll probably just have to keep going. Here. I, I find it interesting that there's been a lot of studies done that show having mortality doesn't affect population dynamics, and yet we're using hunting hmm. to try to control overabundant species. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it is a bit of ironic, isn't it? We expect it to work. Yeah. That's such. That's a great point. Well, and I mean, we're seeing we harvest doesn't seem to influence some of these other species. It's not the driving factor in the species that are are, are on the other side of the, the spectrum as well. And so, the ability for for harvest to influence and regulate populations, at least in its current form, seems to be fairly minimal. Yeah, that's such a central concept. I think right now, in you know, for a long time. Harvest and habitat management <coughs> folks weren't working hand in hand. You know, uh, there are a variety of fields here we're talking about, and so I think now with these models that allow us to really explicitly look at harvest and the implications of harvest on not just population growth but other demographic rates, here's a really neat opportunity to not only link that with habitat but also to ask those questions to say. Holy cow, are we not influencing harvest at all in anything? You know? And, and yet there are lots of discussions about how many ducks of a particular species you can shoot. And so I'm really hoping in the next decade that we start to have those conversations. And, and I know, I say start, I know they're being had, mm -hmm. but really in, in earnest and really start to, to look at how our season framework is, is influenced by those types of relationships. I think that's a really, really interesting conversation to, to carry forward with data in hand. I can't help but add one last thing to that comment because I think that's so important, especially when you think about hunter recruitment and retention. And when we talk about bag limits and potentially increasing them in places because it's not influencing populations, that could be one mechanism to do that. And I really. No, I think that's, I, I agree that's an area that's going to be really important moving forward. So um, I think we'll thank you guys again for coming. And